So today is one of those rare days where something I learned in physics class actually came in handy for some engineering work that I'm doing uh, at work. So basically we are wanting to build a robotic arm of sorts and we want to know what type of motor or how big of a motor we need in order to make sure we can actually lift the robotic arm and a certain payload. So I'm just going to represent this arm as a line because I'm not really sure what it's going to be built out of yet and that this is like the motor, the pivot point and at the end there will be a payload or a weight of some kind that will be lifting. Now when we design it, we actually want to uh, think about what circumstances is, are going to be hardest on the motor because we want to plan for the worst. So actually we really shouldn't draw it with the arm partially lifted because if you think about it, the higher the arm gets, the more the downforce is going to be diverted onto the bearings inside the motor and less on applying less torque to the motor itself. In fact, when it's perfectly straight up and down, uh, the motor doesn't really have to work at all to keep it from toppling. However, m most of the, or whenever the arm is completely horizontal, then all of the downforce is going to be causing a torque on the motor. So let's redraw it with the arm coming straight out and the payload hanging perpendicular. So here we have a scenario where the downforce is perpendicular to this lever or the, the they call it a moment arm. And um, it's a point where the downforce is completely applying uh, torque to the motor. Anyway, uh, the arm itself actually has some weight too, and we're going to draw that with a little dot in the center showing that you, it, you can actually generalize that the mass of the arm, even though it's a pretty large object, the mass has a center, and that's the point that you could balance the arm on your finger if you wanted to. Well, that's really where, that's the place where the center of mass, or where the um, mass will be acting on the system. So if the center of mass is directly above the motor shaft, then all the mass is um, going, in, going straight down into the motor's bearings. Anyway, um, so let's put some numbers to this and because we actually want to calculate a practical example. The length of this arm is going to be, I was going to make a table, well, sure. The length of the arm will be around 500 millimeters or slightly under two feet. I am doing calculations in a metric just because it's usually easier to do calculations in metric when you're working with physics because you're used to the standard units. Um, and honestly, converting metric numbers, even though I can't picture the lengths in my head as well because I'm used to inches and feet, um, it's harder to convert inches and feet and ounces and pounds in my head. So, the payload is going to be 3 kilograms, and I guess I'll call that P. And the arm will be, let's just call it 1 kilogram. So it's not really, notice at this point, it's not fair to say that we have a payload of 4 kilograms because the one kilogram has a different amount of leverage on the motor than the three kilogram does. Um, it's like a, if you have a really long wrench and a short wrench, well, you can apply the same amount of force, but the longer wrench is going to get you more torque. 
So the payload out here actually has a bit of mechanical advantage over the center mass of the arm. And I will see that pan out. Okay, and I guess I'll just call M the mass of the arm, which is one kilogram. So the next thing is, let's just say for now that we want to pick a motor that is strong enough to hold the arm at this position. It doesn't have to move or accelerate. It just needs to have a holding torque enough to balance the weight of the arm and whatever payload we put on it. So that means that the sum of all the torques in the system will balance out to zero. The motor is acting in one direction. Meanwhile, the arm and, and the payload are applying a torque in the opposite direction. And if they're equal, then it is not rotating. So on one side, I'll now split up this into an equation with, I'll just use this sort of fancy T to be the torque of the motor. And that must be equal to uh, the opposite direction of the torque generated from these two masses. And we realize that the equation for uh, torque, some torque is equal to the force being applied times the distance that it's applied from the axis of rotation times the, uh, in this case, well, it, it'll be the, um, I might have to think about it, the sine of the angle between the force and the line that's drawn as the lever. And that means that when the angle is 90 degrees, the sine of 90 degrees is at its maximum, or it's at 1. And then also the torque is at its maximum. However, uh, as the arm rises and we get a situation like this, we see that the force is not all being directed perpendicular to the lever arm. Some of it is actually being directed straight down, uh, which is taken in by the motor's bearings. Okay, well in this case, since uh, we have it drawn with perpendicular, we can actually ignore this component because it's just always going to be one. So really the torque is just the mass times the distance, well not just the mass, it's the force. So down force is mass times the gravitational constant g, or the acceleration due to gravity, sorry. So it's mg times what I'm going to call length over 2. And we know that the center of mass is going to be exactly in the center of this object as long as we have a uniform piece. So let's say we have a pipe. If we design some fancy arm that's wider on one side and skinnier on the other, then you have to work out where the center of mass is somehow else. But let's we'll just assume that it's a uniform piece of like steel pipe. So then the center of mass is in the center, and plus we, uh, we sum that with the torque caused by the payload, which I will call PGL because it is at an L distance from the center of rotation. So now since we know these values, we can compute the torque. M is one kilogram times 9.8 meters per second squared times L over two. Did I give, yeah, I did. L over 2 is going to be half of 500 or 250 millimeters. And uh, here, why don't we just make this 0 0.250 meters? See how easy that is to do? That would, You couldn't do that if we left it in inches. Anyway, um, plus... 
three kilograms times that 9.8 meters per second squared uh, times L, full L, 500.5 uh, meters. Okay, so at this point, I would need a calculator. I've I already worked out the math, or at least pretty similar math, uh, earlier today, and I believe that it's around 15 newton meters. That it's might be slightly different because I think the length of my arm was. Uh, based on if I made it out of a loom, like I actually worked out in the weight of the arm. Anyway, about 15 newton meters. So that's saying if the holding torque of a stepper motor is rated at 15 newton meters, it would be able to hold our arm when it is straight out horizontally like this with a three kilogram payload. However, um, 15 newton meters, is that a lot? Well, these stepper motors which are NEMA 23 and that means that they have a width of 2.3 inches uh, well they are even these these guys are only rated for four sorry three newton meters of holding torque and as they begin to accelerate the torque decreases uh, as speed increases. So that would mean that we would need at least a five to one gearbox reduction to increase that three to 15. But even then the motor would just barely have enough torque to hold the arm straight out and keep it from falling. If we want to be able to lift the arm, we need to exceed 15 newton meters. So in that case, you might go with the next step up of gearbox. If you're buying one, you probably won't find a seven or an eight. The next will probably be like a 10 or a 15. So if we bought a 20, sorry, let's say a 10 to one gearbox, then the motor would be able to produce uh, 30 newton meters of torque at the output shaft of that gearbox, which is plenty enough to be able to raise that arm. And notice, as the arm gets higher, the amount of torque required to keep it from falling actually decreases. Remember that we planned for the worst case. So if you can get that arm to be able to hold, and like this 30 newton meters is probably overkill, unless you wanna be able to swing the arm really fast, or you wanna be able to accelerate very quickly, then you would need lots of amounts of torque. Anyway, I hope that this helped to demonstrate uh, some of I don't know if it's actually a common problem. In engineering, I think it's a common problem. But I guess a somewhat practical application of some Newtonian physics dealing with torques and a little bit of automation and motors and stuff. Anyway, I'll talk to you guys next time. Bye-bye.